Friends, good morning and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church here in Portland, Oregon. We are a creation care congregation, a peace church, and a reconciling congregation. My name is Ethan Gregory, and I am one of the pastors here. This morning, I'm joined in worship by our senior pastor, Reverend Donna Pritchard, our soloist, Andre, Andre Flynn, our organist, Jonas Nordwall, our wonderful tech team in the back, Alex Geisler, Lindsay McGill, Kendall Martin. And as we continue to practice social distancing, our minister of pastoral care, Reverend Andy Oliver, and our lay leader, Jonathan Liu, join us today by video. A few announcements for us this morning. The General Commission on Religion and Race is hosting a webinar on Tuesday afternoon about racism and the UMC. More details about that can be found on our website. On Wednesday, our regular Wednesday morning prayer group will take this week off, but we will still have our regular pastor's Bible study Wednesday evening at 6 p.m. Join me. Uh, if you need the Zoom link, simply email me, or you can find it on our website as well. And as always, be sure to join us today after worship at 11.30 for our regular coffee hour on Zoom. The link is in your bulletin or in the Sunday email. Come and catch up and simply be in connection with us. And now, friends, as Andre begins to light the Christ candle, we're reminded that the light of our God in Christ Jesus illumines the darkness it shines in this place right here in our sanctuary and extends all the way into our homes where we worship at a distance and yet also with one another. And so now with the light lit, the light lit in our homes and in our hearts, let us extend signs of peace and reconciliation to one another. I invite you to do this with those with whom you are worshiping with in your home, or I also invite you to take out a phone or a device and send a text or a message to a friend or loved one and let them know that the peace of Christ, the peace of our God, extends to them this day. And so, friends, the peace of our God in Christ Jesus is with us. Let us enter into worship together.
please join with me in the call to worship. This is the season of epiphany, of revelations and surprises, of deep mystery and sudden understanding. Aha, we say, as if we know the answers, as if we even see the questions before us clearly. And yet, we say, aha, I might be wrong. Aha, you might be right. So we come together this day to worship the one who brings light into darkness, who brings life out of death, and who loves us beyond right or wrong. Aha! Thanks be to God. Let us worship. And now, Reverend Ethan will share a conversation with the children. Friends, good morning. I hope that all of our children are in front of their screens for children's time. Today I'm at my kitchen table. I have something with me. Um, you might have one of these at your at your house. This is, um, if we're being honest, a Batman action figure. I've had uh, several of these uh, throughout my lifetime, uh, particularly when I was around four, five, uh, six, seven. Um, I really, I really wanted to be Batman when I grew up. So I had lots of, lots of Batman action figures. Um, I was even Batman for Halloween sometimes. Uh, and I liked to pretend, uh, with my brother, uh, that we were, that we were Batman and Robin. Uh, perhaps, uh, maybe you, uh, have a favorite superhero or character from a movie or a television show that you like. Uh, that you like to play with, that you like to even maybe pretend uh, to be. Uh, but for me, I was I was all in on this. Uh, I was like, I have a plan. I'm going to be Batman. Uh, that's that's what I want to be uh, when I grow up. Um, as we're all aware now, that that didn't quite work out. Uh, there were a few things uh, wrong uh, wrong with that. Um, I was not, as it turns out, a billionaire. Uh, so uh, being Bruce Wayne and having all of that money to buy uh, cool uh, suits and uh, gadgets, uh, that didn't quite work out. Um, as it turns out, I'm also not very athletic uh, and muscular as Batman is. Uh, so those are some things that are against me. Uh, I do think I'm pretty smart. Batman's pretty smart. Um, but uh, only, only one out of those things that uh, only one out of those three things, uh, that's not not quite enough um, to cut it. Um, but as I grew up, as I got a little bit older, uh, a little bit more discerning and perhaps uh, realistic, uh, I've figured out uh, a bit more who I am, what uh, God is calling me to do and be with my life. And even uh, at 28, there's still uh, lots of un unanswered questions uh, in that regard. God's always uh, calling us to uh, become new things and do new things. Uh, today in the scriptures, we meet Jesus doing this kind of thing with his disciples. It's at the beginning of his ministry. Uh, we know that Jesus had 12 disciples, and this is the point in the story where Jesus goes and finds those 12, uh, particularly uh, one of them, Nathaniel, in John's gospel, uh, has an interaction with him. Nathaniel says, Nathaniel asked him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel's very confused. Jesus walks up to him uh, under this fig tree and says, come and follow me. Uh, and Nathaniel is, is like, uh, I'm not wearing a name tag, Jesus. How, how do you know who I am and why, why did you pick me? Um, but as it turns out, uh, Jesus knows each and every one of us a lot better than even we know ourselves. Uh, Jesus uh, comes and finds us at the most unexpected of times and the most unexpected of places, but uh, doing ordinary kinds of things. Jesus comes and tells us who we are. And speaking our name, Jesus says that we're, we're one of God's beloved. And Jesus invites us to follow him along the way, the way of love, the way of loving our God and loving our neighbor, the way of doing justice, the way of being bearers and proclaimers of peace, and the way of being people who have hope, 
hope that all indeed will be well. And so this week, I, uh, I invite you to think about uh, who is it who is it that you are? And uh, who's, who's Jesus calling you to be? Where, where's Jesus going to find you? What, what fig trees are you sitting under? Uh, and if Jesus walked up to you and said your name, uh, would you follow? So let's pray together. Repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for knowing our name. And thank you for knowing our name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Friends, we enter now into the time in our service in which we share our prayers of joy and concern with one another. We celebrate this season where the light of Christ will find a home in the hearts of all people, in the actions of all kindness, and in the hope of God's coming kingdom. We celebrate our racial equity group working to direct our congregation's response to racism. And we give thanks for teachers and parents for their compassionate ways and caring for our children. We also, we pray for wise deliberations from our elected leaders in response to the recent insurrection. May we experience conflict without violence. May we reconcile with justice and may we find peace with accountability. We seek the Holy Spirit to bring racial equity within our church our nation, and for those who experience racist violence in all its forms. We pray for the world impacted by COVID-19, the quarantine, and the economic fallout. We are especially mindful of the negative impact on those shunted to the side because of their class or their race. We pray for Sally Yates, who is in the ICU at Portland Providence, who has the coronavirus. We pray for Shirley Schultz and her family as her sister, Donna Turner, died this last Wednesday. We pray for Darren Hahn and his family as his mother, Darlene, has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and is awaiting medical treatment. And we pray for those who have recently lost their loved ones and all others we give over to God's care. You may have other prayers of joy or concern on your heart and mind. And so in the silence of these moments, let us lift those prayers to our God together. Let us pray. All praise to you, holy and merciful God, and to your Son, Jesus, King of kings, Son of Mary, Son of man, wise rabbi, caller of women priests, and the great priest of peasants, Savior of the world. 
We come to you as our nation scrambles to shore up security. Our leaders scramble to exude confidence and strength in light of an assault on the nation's capital, a shrine of democracy. O Lord of temple and church, how should one respond to a violation of one's inner sanctum of sacredness? Should we lament or kill? Should we ponder our path or pound the flesh? What do you call us as Christians to do in the midst of American turmoil and failure? We humans do like to gather power by all means. God of all nations and all peoples, what do you want out of America? And is it incompatible with the way we are? Son of Mary, who warned us that you would throw down the powerful, we did not know it would come from within our own ranks. Spirit of holiness, spirit of dismantling, rock-splitting, fire-consuming God, who or what exactly deserves our allegiance? And what does that have to do with the suffering of humanity? And what does it have to do with you? who will banish all suffering by the power of a suffering Christ, in whose name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will never 
I'd like to say just a few words about the scripture which Jonathan will read for us today. It comes from the gospel according to John, a gospel that probably was written about 90 years following Jesus' death and resurrection. And we don't really know who wrote this gospel. We think it was probably written to a community that included both Jewish followers and Gentile converts to Christianity. Jonathan's going to be reading for us from the first chapter of John's Gospel, which is like, sort of like an overture for an opera or a musical, where all of the major themes are rehearsed in this one chapter. Almost all the titles for Jesus appear. And here we have the stories of the beginnings of Jesus' ministry, sort of like Christmas stories for John, beginning with the calling of the disciples. Like much of this gospel, our story today involves a particular person encountering Jesus. Nathaniel, perhaps the most skeptical of all the disciples. Let's listen now as we hear what happens when Jesus meets Nathaniel. Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, 
You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God and from Jesus Christ, who calls us together this day. I wonder, do you remember the old Saturday Night Live sketches that Gilda Radner did as Emily Latella, a perpetually confused commentator who offered opinions such as this one when she said, What's all this fuss I keep hearing about violins on television? Why don't parents want their children to see violins on television? Why, I thought the Leonard Bernstein concert was just lovely. And if they don't show violins on television until after 10 o'clock, the little babies will all be asleep, and they won't see them, and they won't learn any music appreciation. Well, Latella would go on and on and on until the news anchor would lean over and quietly correct her. It's violence on television, not violins. And then Latita would stop mid-rant and look up and smile sweetly, and she would say, never mind. Never mind. Isn't that what we would like to do or to say when we are caught up in a mistaken position or called out for a misconception? We think if we can only look around us, smile sweetly, and quietly say, never mind, we won't have to utter those other supremely difficult words, you may be right, and by extension, I may be wrong. Well, this is the season of Epiphany, these weeks between Christmas and Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent, often referred to as ordinary time. This time between major liturgical seasons, the time we are to live out our faith in everyday life. Epiphany is meant to be a season of revelation about the God in Jesus Christ. Yet it is also a time for self-discovery. Because Christian faith is not about just observing Jesus. It is about following Jesus. Clarence Jordan, the author of the Cotton Patch Gospels, once remarked, We'll worship the hind legs off Jesus and then not lift a finger to do a single thing, he says. It's true, isn't it? Following is much more difficult than observing. Well, if Epiphany is a revelation about God in Christ, it is just as much an eye-opening for us, even about our reluctance to admit you may be right. Rabbi Brad Hirschfield, in his book, You Don't Have to Be Wrong for Me to Be Right, he puts it this way. Why is it that to make things, even spiritual things, more ours, we so often have to make them less someone else's? Why does being right depend on everyone else being wrong? Do other children need to fail in order for ours to succeed? 
we need to see that everyone who is not just like us is not some kind of restoration project, just waiting for us to fix them and turn them into poor imitations of ourselves. Do we really want a world of people who look, think, and act just like we do? That's not spiritual depth, nor is it religious growth, but simply narcissism with a lot of footnotes. Narcissism with footnotes. I think that may have been Nathaniel's first response when Philip tells him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law. It's Jesus from Nazareth. And Nathaniel, he can only say, Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. Can anything good possibly come from Nazareth? That backwater town, we think we know all about it and about the people who live there. We know all about their foibles, their faults, their failings, more even than we know about our own. So quick are we to judge. So easy it is for us to climb up that mountain of self-righteousness and be narcissistic in our rightness. My friends, we all have Nazareth in our lives. Those people and places and situations which we question and label and judge, those from which we neither expect nor can see any possibility of anything good coming from. You see, Nathaniel's question is not a new one, nor is it unique to Nathaniel. We ask that very same question every day. Can anything good come out of Washington? Can anything good come out of Islam? Can anything good come out of the Good News Movement or the Wesley Covenant Association in the United Methodist Church? Can anything good come out of the immigrant, the foreigner, the stranger? Can anything good come out of the Black Lives Matter or the Me Too movements? Can anything good come out of the broken, difficult, painful places in our lives as a nation, in our lives as a church, and in our lives as individuals. But here's the thing. Nathaniel's question, it is not really about Nazareth at all. And the same is true for all the questions we ask, whomever or whatever our Nazareth of the moment might be. Our questions say more about us than they do about our Nazareth. They are questions about our beliefs and disbeliefs about ourselves and others and about God. They are questions which are bound up in our biases, whether they be explicit or implicit. They are questions tangled up in our fears and our wounds, our guilt and our shame. They are questions which betray our all too often inability to utter those four simple words, you may be right. In our Zoom Bible study on Wednesday night, where there is always a good discussion and a great hour of connecting together, you should try it if you haven't already. Well, this week we looked at this passage from John's Gospel. And we spent a little time exploring 
why the story opens with Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree. It is no coincidence that. Remember, it is a fig tree that gives Adam and Eve the leaves behind which they hide from God and themselves. Likewise, it is a fig tree that Jesus later curses for producing no fruit. You see, the fig tree is symbolic of our assumptions, the judgments we make about the world and the blind spots in our own world views, which become for us hiding places. And they are not fruitful. They keep us from a deeper knowledge of ourselves and each other, and even, yes, a deeper knowledge of God. Well, Monday is, as you know, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a day to remember the life and the work of a great civil rights leader, a hero of this nation. Yet it is also a day to recognize and to admit how far this nation is from realizing Dr. King's great dream of equity and justice for all God's children. It is a day for us to confess our complicity in a system which privileges some while oppressing others. It is a day to listen deeply to people of color when they rage and to join with them, not only in the raging, but also in the weeping. In one of Dr. King's sermons, he read the gospel story of James and John, the two disciples who asked Jesus if they might have the seats of honor to sit at the right and the left hand of Christ when he ascended into glory. And this is what Dr. King said. Jesus transformed the situation by giving a new definition of greatness. He said to them, Now, brethren, I can't give you greatness, and really, I can't make you first. That's what he said to James and to John. You must earn it. True greatness comes not by favoritism, but by fitness. And the right hand and the left are not mine to give. They belong to those who are prepared. So Jesus gave us a new norm of greatness. Dr. King says, if you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that the one who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That is Jesus' new definition of greatness. And the thing I like about it, King says, is that giving that definition of greatness means everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity or the second theory of thermodynamics in physics. You don't have to know any of that to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And you can be that servant. Nazareth is not about the other person. It is about the condition of your own heart. Nazareth is not about another's economic value to you, but the willingness of your heart to value another human being. 
Nazareth is not about how much power you have or another has. It is about choosing to empower and to support the life of another. Nazareth is not about a religion, a race, a nationality, a sexual orientation, a gender identity, an economic or an immigration status. Nazareth is about Emmanuel, God, with each and every one of us. And here's the good news, my friends. For every one of our Nazareth, there is the invitation to come and see. Every time we find ourselves bound up in that limiting space of our assumptions, hiding away, producing no fruit, every time Jesus gives us the chance to leave behind those assumptions, to get beyond our hiding places, to give up our certitude, and to risk learning something new about ourselves, about each other, about God. This morning, it might be easy to be discouraged about all the hiding we've done under the fig trees of our assumptions. It might be easy to give up on the possibility of God's beloved community. But hear these words of another great civil rights leader, the late Representative John Lewis. Do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. And never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in trouble. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Never, ever let us be afraid to take a chance on a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. <clears throat> For then you will find the courage to go beyond a simple, never mind, to acknowledge you may be right, and then you will know Jesus' invitation is for you, as well as Nathaniel. Come and see all that God has in store for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh.
Friends, we enter now into the time in our service in which we respond to the God whom we have met and worship this day through the giving of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. The instructions for giving by check or online will be on your screen in just a moment. And so as we prepare, let us enter into prayer together. Open our ears, open our eyes, open our minds indeed, O oh God. Open them to the truth that you have for us the truth that we are loved, that you have found us, that you have called us by name, and that you have invited us to follow along the way. And so as we begin to take steps, whether they're our first or our 1,000th, let us do so as we give. And so bless these our gifts, tithes, and offerings this day, that they might be used to further your way the way of love and justice in the world. We pray all this in the name of the one who has called us by name. Amen. Love is patient, love is kind, never ending, never ending, slow to
And now, my friends, do not be afraid to live with a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Jesus sees you there under your fig tree. Come out from hiding. And may the peace of Christ be with us all. Amen.